Welcome Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders to our overview of LifeWay's Explore the Bible lesson of 1 Kings 15, 9 through 22 with the title of Return for Sunday, July 3rd, 2022. One way that you could begin this lesson would be to refer to the landmark decision our Supreme Court handed down last week, overturning the Roe v. Wade decision from 1973 that uh, somehow found a guarantee of abortion rights in the Constitution. For almost 50 years, our country has endured this evil, 63 million babies estimated being killed. But uh, a week ago Friday, June 24th, that was overturned, marking a great turn back from evil in our country. Uh, you could introduce it with some other story of a turning back or a revival that took place, maybe in your church, or a pastor who came and turned things around, or a personal turning back to God in your life or the life of somebody you know. Whichever way you use to begin it, then you could say, this week, our lesson in 1 Kings refers to a similar turning back, a revival that took place in Judah under King Asa. Now, note, as we talked about last time, we see the divided kingdom here, Israel in the north and Judah uh, in, in the south. Verse 9 opens this passage saying, So in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, ten tribes of the north that split away, Asa began to reign as king of Judah, the, the southern kingdom that stayed with the descendants of Solomon. The focus on this lesson is going to be on Asa and the southern kingdom of Judah. You might have your map handy again this week and point out where Judah is as a reminder. The context, uh, chapter 14, uh, gives us, uh, says Solomon's son uh, Rehoboam, king of Judah, did evil, verse four, uh, 22 says, building false idols and places of worship, unfortunately following in uh, the, the way Solomon left off, allowing male cult prostitutes, doing what the nations God had cast out from the land before Israel came, did. Then verse chapter 15 opens with Rehoboam's son Abijam becoming king, and he continued in the same sins, verse 3 says. And we come to our focus passage, 1 Kings 15, 9 to 22, as Asa becomes king over the southern kingdom Judah. And verse 11 says, Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord. So Asa brought about a revival. He brought about a return to the Lord in the land. That's the title for this week's lesson, being returned. So Asa brought a revival, a return to the Lord. But what did that really consist of? What did he do? See, when we return to God, there should be some specific marks of it. You know, back back in the old days, when I was growing up, but we'd often see decisions in the church called rededicating your life to the Lord. Some of y'all remember that. That's a good thing. But uh, when we rededicate ourselves, we need to be think of what specifically are we rededicating ourselves to. I remember once I was a counselor at a youth camp and a young person came forward and said, I want to rededicate myself to the Lord. I said, that's great. I said, but what do you mean specifically by that? Are there some specific things you're going to stop doing that you've been doing? Are there some things you haven't been doing that you're going to start doing? When you say you're going to rededicate your life, what specifically are you going to do differently? I encourage them to make it specific. Well, here uh, we see the Bible says Asa leads his people in a return to God. What does that mean specifically? Well, here you can uh, point out uh, to your class or you can have them read this passage and, and them call them out and you write it on the dry erase board or whatever. What specifically do we see in verses 11 to 15 that Asa did specifically that was right in the sight of the Lord? Well, we see Verse 12, he removed the male cult prostitutes from the land. Verse 12b, he removed the idols his father had made. Verse 13, he removed his mother from being a queen mother. More on that later. He cut down her image and he burned it. Verse 14, he was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days. Verse 15, he rededicated silver and gold utensils to the Lord and brought them to the temple. So you see, these were specific things he did, specific evidences of his return to the Lord. He didn't just say, let's return to the Lord. Let, let's get right. He led them to do some specific things. And that's how it should always be. When you get your heart right with God, you're going to show it in some specific ways, some specific actions. There'll be some specific things you stop doing, like Asa did here, stop the cult prostitutes, stop the idols. He, he did some positive things. He removed his mother. He gave the utensils to the Lord and so on. So you might challenge your group as we would want to be right with God today. What specific actions would God be saying to you that you need to take to return to him? Are there some things you need to stop? Or this is some things that you need to start or start doing again? Don't just be content to say, I want to be right with God in some generic way. If you're really coming back to him, show it in some specific actions. So I think it's a very good way to open and begin that lesson with that focus. 
But then one of these actions specifically sticks out to me, and I, I would make much of this application, and you can do that if God leads you to or not. But I think the Bible kind of focuses on it here too in verse 13 and what Asa did regarding his mother. Verse 13 says he removed Micah, his, his mother, from a being queen mother because she had made a horrid image as an Asherah. Even though she was his mother, he destroyed the ungodly image she worshipped and even went to the extreme of removing her from her position as queen mother, giving us an application here that to me is one of the most difficult aspects of the Christian life. Some of the hardest and most difficult stands we will take for the Lord may be in regard to our own family. So this could be a place where in your lesson you talk about the balanced place. Remember, the Christian life so much depends on balance. The balanced place the family should have in the Christian life. God's Word shows us family is a priority, but it is not to be our ultimate priority, as many mistakenly believe. So you could open this section by asking, what are some verses that talk about the priority of family for the believer? Of course, we can think of many. Genesis 2, the man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, they shall become one flesh. Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives. 1 Timothy 5, if anyone doesn't provide for his own family, he's worse than an unbeliever. And you and your class can think of many others. So as a result of the priority the, the Bible places on family, many people say, well, family is number one. But that's not quite the Christian viewpoint. As odd as it may sound, Family is not number one for the Christian. God is number one. As always, the Bible's our guide on this, and, and Scripture's very clear on it. You, you could ask again in your class, what are some verses, scriptural examples you can think of that teach that the Lord is to have priority even over our family? We'll see a number of instances in, in the, the Gospels. Matthew 4, James and John leave the boat and their father and follow Jesus. Following him was more important than, than staying with their own father. Luke 8, 19 to 21 Jesus' mother and brothers couldn't get to him because of the crowd. And they tell him, your, your mother and brothers are standing outside. But Jesus said in verse 21, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Uh, putting the, my earthly family is not number one in my life. Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, we don't believe Jesus literally meant to hate our family, but he's saying that following him is to be our greatest priority, even over our family. In Luke 12, 5, Jesus says, Do you suppose I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. He said in verse 15, they'll be divided, uh, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, and, and so on, because you're going to have to choose following him above them, all of which what tells us the, for the Christian, family is not number one. Jesus is to be number one. And obeying him is to take priority over everyone and everything else in our lives. One true example from the mission field, my sister serves with the IMB in Southeast Asia. A young man was saved there last year and his father was so angry that he had left their ancient traditions and become a Christian. He, he cut him off from paying for his college and called him back home. In fact, he, he called him to stand before the whole family and explain himself and this decision which he made, which was, of course, a great opportunity, by the way, for him to share the gospel, which he did. But they were all against him. He basically had to go against his whole family to follow Christ. But this is exactly what Jesus wanted him to do. Family was not number one. Jesus was number one. So, so you might ask your class, has anything like this ever happened to you or someone you know? Have you ever had to take a stand for the Lord that opposed family or was offensive to family, spouse, or kids, or, or other relatives? I know in my life there have been several times when I had to stand on some biblical principles that uh, maybe my extended family wasn't happy about. You may have examples like that. Your class may have examples like that that you can share and emphasize that as Christians, we should never seek to offend people. We want to be as loving as we can. The fact is, like Jesus said, if we follow him, there will be times when we have to choose him even over our own family. And when those times come, we need to be willing to do it. Just like Asa shows us here, family is not number one for the Christian. God is. So I think that's a, another good application you can make if God leads you to in this lesson. Then uh, let's, let's look for just a second at the last section of our focus passage, verses 16 to 22, at what, what I might call Asa's pragmatic compromise. Verse 17 says the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, award against Asa. So verse 18 says he, that Asa took the silver and gold from the temple 
and gave it to Ben-Hadad of Syria, who was north of Israel, who then went to war against Israel and caused them to withdraw from their war against Asa and Judah. Well, it was a perhaps some might call it a shrewd political move, but you might ask your class, do you think what Asa did here was right? The Bible doesn't say in this passage it was good that he did this or it was bad that he did it. It just records what happened. So it could be open for some discussion there. Do you think it's good or bad what he did? But in other places in Scripture, it becomes more clear. God tells his people in several other passages, do not go to other nations for help. He said in Isaiah 31, 1, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. In our uh, First Baptist Angleton daily Bible reading this week, Hosea 7, 11 said they call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. But verse 10 says, But they haven't returned to Yahweh their God nor sought him for all this. And there's several passages like that in, in the Old Testament. Uh, in in, in, sec, in fact, in Second Chronicles sixteen seven to ten, the prophet Hanani specifically does rebuke Asa for what he did in this situation, taking the things that were dedicated to the Lord in His temple and giving it to the king of Syria. So, uh, the thing is, you don't want this just to be a speculative history lesson, and we need to remember that every week. We're, we're not just here teaching Bible history. We always need to apply the scripture to us today. How can we apply this? Well, we could apply it. One way might be to ask your class, what are some ways we today might compromise in the same kind of way that Asa did? What are some people or some things we might turn to in place of really seeking God? And of course, a number of answers you could suggest the government. Sometimes we immediately just turn to the government instead of seeking God. We seek to, to pull some political strings instead of really seeking God. Or we, we run right to the doctor instead of seeking God. Or we go get worldly counsel and advice in, instead of God's. Uh, one application might be, just like Asa took God's money from the temple to solve his problem, maybe we take our tithe money or our building fund money or some other funds we've dedicated to the Lord and use it to solve a problem we have instead of looking to God and seeking him. And, and I would emphasize, you know, there, there's a place to seek help from government and medicine. And they're, they're not all bad, but we should never seek them first. And we should definitely never seek them in place of God or compromise what, has, so what should have been given to God, which is what Asa did here. So Asa was basically a good king. He led in a revival or a return to the Lord in many ways, but he did compromise some in his situation. And, and that reminds us, you know, even good Christians are never perfect. And we all have to rely on the grace of God. So some good lessons here. Hope that will help you get started on your lesson and some applications for your class Sunday. Remember, if you write something in the comment section below, I will be sure to pray for you specifically and for your class this Saturday and Sunday. If you hit the subscribe button, YouTube will notify you as soon as the next lesson comes out and you won't have to search for it. And for those of you who want them, remember I've started uh, posting the text of this lesson and written notes. If you want to get some of these scripture verses or whatever to help you or even take this into class with you, the, these notes are available to you at www.seanethomas.com, S-H-A-W-N-E-T-H-O-M-A-S.com. I'll put a link to it in the comment section and uh, you can get these notes if, if that'll be a help to you. On a personal note, let me just say thank you. So many of you indicated you were praying for our travel to South Carolina, to our son's wedding. Your prayers were answered. We were almost sideswiped five different times on the drive up there, but we arrived untouched, perfectly safe, had the best time with our kids and grandkids, and, and we're now home. So it was a beautiful wedding, beautiful time. Thank you so much for praying with us. I, I appreciate uh, your prayers more than you know. Remember, I'll be praying for you this weekend. See you next time, Lord willing.